Alif Lam Mim Tanzil Al-Kitab La Rayb Fih Min Rabb Al-Alamin Am Yaqulun Aftarah Bal Huwa Al-Haq Min Rabb Kalitun Dhir Qawman Ma Atahum Min Nadhir Min Qablika La'allahum Yahtadun What's up guys? Welcome back to another video. If you're new here, my name is Yusuf and if you're someone who generally makes good decisions in life, hit that subscribe button down below. Let's move on to the video. Now for those wondering where did this guy disappear to after making two videos, I didn't disappear. I was on a spiritual, <laughs> a spiritual journey to the Holy Lands, to Saudi Arabia. The kingdom called and the slave answered. That's where I was. And this video is going to be a recap of my experience, telling you about all the highlights, telling you about all the do's, the don'ts, and any tips and tricks that would have helped me immensely had I known them beforehand. So if you know anyone who's gearing up to go on this journey, or if you know anyone who's planning on going on this journey sometime in the near future, share this video around. It's going to, might be long, but it'll be informative, it'll be worth it. Trust me, let's get going. Check out this cool little prop I picked up over there. This will be my prop for today's video. Look at the detailing. Check it out. I mean, the stone's supposed to be black, but we'll let him pass. So what I'll do is I'll start with a recount of the events. From, so from the moment we left Melbourne en route to Saudi Arabia, and I'll call out each of the key destinations and run through what we experienced there. What were the highlights? What were some of the things that really surprised me? What were the things that really tested me? And what, what are the things I would have loved to have known beforehand that would have made those situations easier and more bearable to handle? Because let me tell you, this was hands down the most stressful, the most testing experience of my life but at the same time, the best experience of my life. How that works, I've got no idea, but let me tell you, it is something that everyone should definitely do. Do not delay. If you have the chance, if you have the means, get off your ass. What I mean to say is, if you have the means, book your tickets, get over there. You will not regret it. I guarantee you that. Now, our trip started in Melbourne with first destination being Singapore. We just had a short transit there, everything smooth sailing. I got exit row seats, so it's just golden. From Singapore, we're off to Dubai. We get to Dubai safe and sound. This is where the fun starts. Here I am thinking this is just, you know, a normal plane trip, man. What what can go wrong? Everything that can possibly go wrong in an airport went wrong. We had an 11 hour layover in Dubai before heading to Jeddah. We spent nine of those 11 hours in the airport, handing our passports, taking them back, handing them back again, taking them back again, to the point where you're just like, you know, I'll keep my passport. Australian passport, I don't really give a damn anymore. You keep it, I don't want it. It's frustrating, man. They send you to this terminal, that waiting location. The bus is gonna be here in 15 minutes. Three hours later, where's this bus? Patience, you said, patience. Journey hasn't even started and you're losing the plot. This is unbelievable. So a word of warning. If you're a frequent traveler, you expect to get to an airport, you know, get your boarding pass, wait for your plane to board, fly to the next destination, smooth sailing. This is not gonna happen. Especially if you're traveling with a big group and you've got a lot of different identities or people who hold passports of different nationalities, that only complicates the process even more. So I stress your patience needs to kick in as soon as you leave your home shores. I know it sounds a bit far-fetched, a bit, a bit extreme, but trust me, if you set your patience levels up here, then this will not break you. I came in thinking, 
I won't be tested until you know the real days of Hajj and oh, I got absolutely destroyed. So, tip number one, patience, there. Now another thing that is key, set your logistical expectations of the trip so low, so through the floor that you can't, like, they barely even exist, right? And I'm saying logistical expectations, not expectations of the whole trip, just the logistics, getting from A to B, getting this transferred from here to there. Things like that are going to be a nightmare. So if you go in with the mindset that you already expect them to be a nightmare, you're going to be fine. So that is critical. Patience and logistical expectations for the trip, negative 45,000. You're golden. So once we finally got out of Dubai airport, we transferred to a hotel nearby, had about 15 minutes to change into our ihram. That was, that was actually an amazing experience, putting it on for the first time. It felt great. Then you go back downstairs and the kafafa starts again. Someone's late, someone's still in the shower, we can't call them, we don't know what room they're in because we handed out random passes to everyone. And then the bus is late. And then you're probably gonna miss the plane. And then it's just, just sit down and cry. <laughs> now, one thing about the ihram, and I was freaking out a little bit. Oh, actually, I was freaking out a lot, especially about the bottom half, because you've got no underwear or no undergarments. I needed to make sure that thing was tight. And I feel like the first time I put it on, my internal organs were going to come out through my mouth because that's how tight I made it. But if you want to see me show you a, a quick tutorial on how to tie that thing up because you're just so worried it's gonna fall down at the worst moment, I can do that. Um, but rest assured of the two million odd people that were there and the ones that I saw, no one had any embarrassing moments where their head on fell down or whatnot. So don't worry, you're gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. I mean, the airflow is sensational. It gets really hot in the heat, but you know, pros and cons, you live with it. You move on. And for those who don't know what an ihram is, just picture an oversized white towel. It's essentially all it is. You can get them in all kinds of different thicknesses. Now, we can go into, is it better to have a thicker one? Is it better to have something that's a bit thinner? I think that's a whole other conversation. I don't want to blow this video out too long. But if those are the kinds of things that you want to hear about, then do let me know and I will happily make a video for you guys. So. We board the bus en route to Dubai airport to catch our flight to Jeddah. Mind you, boarding opens in like 10 minutes and we're running really late. We get there on time, alhamdulillah, and then you're in the airport just hoping and praying. Haram, please don't fall down in front of all these people who are already looking at me weird. I don't want to flash the entire world right here. Please, please stay on. It stayed on. Amazing. We get onto the plane. Now this plane is jam-packed with people going to hatch. It's full to the rafters. Now I'm telling you, I've never seen a boarding process so complex, so long than the plane going from Dubai to Jeddah. They had so many different nationalities, so many different people, people that can't speak English, people with disabilities, and they have to cater to everyone. Mind you, they do an awesome job of that but it takes time and again patience it doesn't matter if you're first in line it doesn't matter if you're last that plane is not taking off until every single seat is accounted for and everyone is on board stress less you're actually better off waiting there for the last person to board and you know as opposed to waiting in line for two hours take it easy relax save your energy now the flight to Jeddah is Smooth sailing, the only thing I'll call out is you've got a lot of different travel groups going to Hajj and they've all got different leaders leading the groups. Now, one thing that was pretty, not so much weird, but just felt a bit unnecessary to me was one of the, one of the leaders who happened to be sitting in the row behind me waited until the exact point that he thought we were traveling over the Miigat, so which is the point where you need to make your destination. Uh, now, he wasn't using any fancy tools or any equipment that other people didn't have at their disposal. 
to me, it sounded like he was waiting until we were 23 or 24 minutes from the destination to let the group know that it's time to make your intention. Mind you, the pilot has already given the signal that we are crossing or we are about to cross the Mugat. So everyone on board should make your intention. Now the pilot's got all kinds of navigation tools, all kinds of radars. They know exactly where we are at whatever point in time it is. They know if we've had to taxi for an extra 10 minutes. They know if we've had to circle, if we've had to hold, if we're in a holding pattern. This guy has no idea. So the risk is if you do not make your intention before you cross the Mi'kat, you actually have to return back before the Mi'kat to make your intention again, then proceed into Jiddah. So it's risky and, and it's just unnecessary to get a whole group of a hundred odd people to take the same risk with you. I don't know, man. For me, I'd play it safe. As soon as the pilot gives you that heads up saying we're about to cross the Mi'kat, make your intention and you're golden. So we land in Jiddah airport. You start to feel the heat now. Mind you, Dubai was hot as well, but you're walking through the airport. It's nothing fancy. Then you start to see the segregation of lines. Now there's a lines for Europeans, Americans, Australians, and then there's a line for people from more developing nations. And at the end of the lines for the developing nations, you you see these nurses or doctors just jabbing people. And I'm just like, mm, get your hands off me. You ain't jabbing me today. I'm walking in the express lane. So I beelined straight past everyone, went through all the customs and it was actually so simple in Jiddah. It literally took five minutes. We were out, collected our bags, and this is where the, the real fun, the real fun began. <laughs> so we walk out into this big open area outside Jiddah airport. And first thing on the checklist is, I need a SIM card. So you go up to these little stands and you've got these kids walking around with a phone and a fingerprint scanner. And I'm just like, what is going on here? So they ask you SIM card and you're like, yeah. So it's like, come with me. So you go there, he pulls out his phone, fills out some details, just your name, your passport number. It's really quick. Takes a scan of your index finger. There's your SIM card. Nice and easy. How do I recharge it? Sorry, brother, no recharge here. Yeah? Recharge in Mecca. Okay, man, I don't really need to call anyone right now, but it's a bit inconvenient for you to sell me a SIM card that I can't use yet. Anywho. Oh, one other thing. Reception in, well, Mecca area is absolutely atrocious. So I didn't even see the point of having a SIM card or having a phone to the point where I thought there was no, there's really no use of having this Saudi Arabian SIM card, this mobile nonsense that every second call you try to make doesn't go through and you get this Arab operator talking some nonsense to you and it's just like, oh man, I'm just trying to call somebody. So yeah, I mean, don't have the expectations that you're gonna get the kind of coverage that you get back home. It's not gonna happen, but to make a call in an emergency or, you know, when you do need it, it, it'll work fine. It does the job. Also, if you're choosing between providers at the airport, I went with Mobiley or Mobily, whatever it's called, and it is so atrocious, so horrible. The other one that some people went with was STC and they had a bit more luck with that one. So I recommend going for STC if you find it. Just another small tip. So we've got our SIM cards and we're just sitting in the waiting area. It's 40 something odd degrees. You're burning and you're just waiting for the buses to take you to the apartment. Now, we were told beforehand that this process getting from Jiddah to the apartment on a bad day can take up to 10 hours. So I was prepared for the worst. But after about an hour, we were ushered towards the buses and I'm just like, Hey man, this is pretty good because the trip from Jiddah to Shisha, the place we were staying, shouldn't, shouldn't have taken more than two hours, three hours on a bad day. Like as soon as we started moving, it should be okay. So the, the, the hardest part was actually getting everyone on the bus, getting everyone checked off and getting that thing moving. So we walk towards the buses, line up outside and upon entering the bus, someone 
grabs your passport off you and throws it into a random plastic bag. Mm. This, this is what really peeves me about the way Saudi folk run the logistics for Hatch. Why would you take passports and throw them into random bags and leave them with the driver Mind you, it looks like they just pulled this guy off the street and said, you're driving this bus today. That's our livelihoods in that plastic bag. Well, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know, if we lose that, then it's not going to be fun getting back or getting anywhere for that matter. So that's just ridiculous, but that's what they do. And that's apparently what they do to everyone. So you'll see it. They'll grab your passport. They'll throw it into a random bag and somehow by some miracle of God, it'll reappear the day you're returning to your home country. You will get your passport back. <laughs> the bus driver will have it. I don't know how. A different bus driver, completely different bus driver, will have your passport and he will give them back. Do they lose some? I don't know. Did we have any lost on our bus? No. Mm, if it works for them, it works. But... For me, I'm like, surely there is a more sophisticated way of doing this. It's 2019. Let's stop being dinosaurs. So we're on the bus en route to Shisha. Now Shisha is just a suburb inside Mecca. Now I can, uh, I'll put up a map just to, you know, give you a rough understanding as to where things are. And I'm thinking, great man, we're going to get there in world record time until the bus driver makes an announcement. I'm going to stop for a small detour. You can refresh, pray, stretch your legs, and then we'll get back on our way. In my head, I'm thinking, no man, no. One, there's no one on this bus who is accountable for the group because the leader is on a different bus. Two, we don't need to pray right now because it's pitch dark, we're travelers anyway. We can pray when we get to the destination. Three, we're late as it is, man, and I'm tired. We've been traveling for the last two days. Just keep moving, man. Four. Move, damn it. But did they listen to me? No. Did I protest? A little bit. Then I gave up. Because you quickly come to realize that some battles, or most battles, when you're on Hajj are not worth fighting. Just have your patience. Grit your teeth, smile, and get on with the journey. Hmm. So the trip that I thought was gonna take a couple of hours ended up taking about five. I fell asleep and I was woken up by some random guy just tapping me, wake up dude, wake up. Flashing some wristband in my face saying, you need this, very important, put it on. I'm like, okay dude. So I put the wristband on, I look outside the window, we are in. The ghettos of Mecca. It was so run down. It was... I had no words to describe this place. But I thought, man, all I need right now is a shower and a bed and some sleep. And that's what happened. I went straight to sleep until the very next morning. Now, most people that come to Hajj from pretty far distances come to do Umrah and Hajj. So Hajj Tamatu. So you usually do your Umrah and then a few days later the Hajj commences. We actually had some people who arrived to Shisha with us and went and did their Umrah that very same night. Now I don't know how many Barakas they took that morning, but that is not normal. You don't have that much energy. It's just crazy, man. It's just crazy. I'm like, man, we are waiting until tomorrow. Nobody's going to die. And there's a better chance that I'm going to be, you know, in a better state of mind. I'm going to get more out of it. I'm sleeping now. Don't ask me any questions. That is that. So the next morning rolls around. We pray Fajr and then we have a little talk as to how the logistics are going to work for doing Umrah today. And everyone's excited man this is you're about to see the Kaaba for the first time it's you know for most people in our group this was the very first time 
they had come for the pilgrimage. So it was exciting times and you could see it in people's faces. The energy in the room was just buzzing. So we get to the bus, the bus that's going to take us to the Haram and we board. It's, it's actually a pretty, pretty quick journey. It took about 35, 40 minutes. Mind you, I had nothing to compare it to or no, you know, no, there was no waterline. I didn't know what was good, what was bad at this point. So we got there um, and we gathered and we were told this is going to be the meeting point. So what I do when I'm in new locations, I look around for landmarks. So hotels, buildings, mountains, whatever it may be that I'll remember and I can go, yep, this is in between that and that. I'm coming back here. So they told us to come back here. There was a high chance that we were going to be split. So there's a hundred odd people, close to 200 people. Um, there was a high chance we we're going to be split. And in the case that you are split, come back here at 2.30 or whatever, whatever the time is. And the bus will take you back to Shisha. I'm like, oh, good. Power forward. So as we're walking towards the mosque, uh, me, my wife, and another couple, we were like, you know what, there's a high chance we're going to be split, but the four of us will stick together. Make sure we all get out of this alive and, you know, get through it. Man, <laughs> that was some wishful thinking. The problem is, you can plan for months, for years if you want to, as soon as you enter the boundaries of the mosque, and you see the number of people, the sheer number, the masses of worshippers, everything just goes. I forgot how to talk at one point. And as soon as I actually saw the Kaaba, I froze. I didn't say anything. I, to, to be honest, I didn't know where I was. It was only like literally 30 seconds later that I realized and remembered as soon as I saw it, I needed to say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. So you can plan, you can write a million things down. As soon as you get there, you will be overwhelmed unless you've done, you know, Umrah previously or Hajj previously. And this is not as, not as new an experience, which is, which is different, right? Um, so yeah, expect to be overwhelmed. It happens to everyone. Just make sure that you have someone beside you who is constantly reminding you of the things that you need to do to make sure that your acts of worship are valid and accepted and you haven't just wasted all this time, effort and money and you forgot something critical, right? So we make our way to the ground floor so we can commence our Tawaf for the Umrah and the Kaaba just gets closer and closer and the closer you get, the, m the more amazing it is. I mean, you look at this, this little tiny replica of it and this in itself looks incredible so you can imagine what the real thing looks like now the the, the life is essentially just circumambulating this Kaaba seven times right and in my head I'm thinking all right orderly fashion seven circuits how hard can it be boy was I going to learn today people uh, animals. The reason, if you want to know the reason why the Muslim Ummah will never unite, go and do it to life. Or go there, go to, go to Mecca during the times of Hajj and you will learn. I was pushed, I was side bumped, I was thrown around and I'm like, you know, I'm not a small person. But the craziest part is, you know who was pushing me around? Little tiny Indonesian women. Big bulky Nigerian women. Now I'm not, I'm not like, you know, targeting a particular nationality or anything, but I'm gonna be, you know, I'm gonna give you the facts. You need to be wary of these women, especially the ones that come underneath burrow and then just spurt out of nowhere like you're like in Mario world. And it's just, what is this man? Where'd you come from? And you know, some of them, you know, they just eat the flour and they turn into these really big bulky creatures and they just start elbowing you, pushing you around. 
And I'm just like, hey man, I'm just here to do my seven circuits. I don't want to push. I don't want to shove. I'm here standing there like this the whole time. I'm like, if I do push you, you're going to get hurt. So, you know, let's just, let's just be civil. No, there is none of that. It is honestly warfare. And the, two, the other couple that we thought we were going to, you know, complete the seven circuits with, we lost them in the first 15 seconds. I turned around and I couldn't see anybody. No one, no one from our group, as a matter of fact. We lost everyone. So you can imagine every single person there is just completely tunnel visioned. I'm here. This is me and my Lord. Everyone else doesn't matter. And that's essentially the way they treat you. Like you don't exist. They will trample all over you if they need to do what they need to do. It's madness. And that, that was really disappointing, to be honest. That, that was very disappointing to see. Like you have old people being pushed over, ladies falling to the ground. There are some people with, like I saw a man completing his life with no legs. Like you've got every person with all kinds of, you know, disabilities, all kinds of handicaps, trying to do the same thing. So you need to keep that in mind and make sure that the mannerisms, the way you're acting accommodates everyone. It's not just you there. There's a million and one other people, but everyone seems to forget that. It is absolute madness. Also a quick pro tip for the men who are in the ihram, when you're starting your tawaf, you're supposed to uncover your right shoulder. Now amongst all this madness, there were a thousand, I don't know, so many people that forgot. So keep that in the forefront of your mind, just constantly remind yourself when I'm starting, I have to uncover my right arm. And as soon as you're done, you cover it back up again. Just, yeah, keep that in mind because you don't want to forget that. It's, it's something so simple, but in the heat of the moment, a lot of people forget. So the, the, the life itself is actually quite simple. Now, outside of the physical walking, the, the seven circuits, there are the du'as and the supplications that you make. Now, you can use your phone to write these down and read off them during um, your tawaf, but I would highly advise that you have them memorized and you don't need to refer to things because things will get knocked out of your hand. You might need your hand to, you know, hold on to things. So if you can memorize them, that is best. But if you can't, then no problem. You can use your phone. Just be careful. I would advise probably sticking to the outer edges of the circle. If you're going to use your phone or you're going to read from a book. Um, the other thing to call out is when you are doing the, the tawaf, the, the third, the corner, the Yemeni corner, which comes. So this is, this is the stone, what is supposed to be the black stone. Oh, it's not focusing. So that there. Now, the corner directly before that is the Yemeni corner. So the Rukna Yemeni. Now, as soon as you cross that, you're supposed to start your Rabbana Atina until you get to the corner with the, the stone and then you restart your circuit. There is all kinds of madness all kinds of absolute mental activity that goes on as soon as you <clears throat> approach this Yemeni corner and you can read about the significance of the corner um, and you approach it so between the, that corner and the, the corner where the, the black stone is it is chaos now if you're not in good physical shape, I advise you to stay far away from the Kaaba as possible in that vicinity. Do not attempt to get close because from that Yemeni corner onwards, people are literally fighting, shoving, punching, doing all kinds of ridiculous, shameful things to touch the corner and to touch the black stone. Now, I seeing this, I, I, said, no way, I'm not getting getting involved in that. I have to do all kinds of haram to actually touch either of those things. So not for me. Well, not right now. Um, and it was just madness. You've got people grabbing their garments, wiping them all over the Kaaba, just bashing their heads against it, just 
falling over, collapsing. It was, you see things that are just out of this world. But hey man, you can't let that distract you from the purpose that you yourself have and the reason you came to complete your Hajj. You need to make, you need to hold steadfast to that. So all of these are distractions. You've got a lot of distractions. You're going to want to comment. You're going to want to say, why is he doing this? Or why is he doing that? Just hold your tongue. You keep going. You do what you need to do and you get out. Now, once you've completed your seven circuits, you cover your right shoulder. And this is where you need to pray your two rakat behind the Maqam Ibrahim. This is another thing that drove me nuts. So the Maqam Ibrahim is really close to the, the, the first corner of the Kaaba. So as soon as you pass the Hajj al-Aswad, you, you'll see it there. And the point is to stand behind it and offer two, two rakat. That's it's all it is. Ideally, if you can be directly behind it, it's perfectly fine. But the reason that you can't be is because you have people who are so inconsiderate that they just sit there. I saw some people sleeping behind it. So you want people who just want to pray to take a minute and get out of there. But you've got people sleeping, not moving. So they make it impossible for everyone else. Now, you don't, you don't have to be directly behind the Maqam. You can be anywhere in the Kaaba. So my advice is don't bother with trying to get directly behind it. People will actually step on you as you're, as you're down doing your sujood. So don't, it's just, it takes away from the moment. So you find a place that's slightly less crowded and offer your turakat there. It's so much, you've got so much more for sure. There's so much more, you know, you're at peace with your surrounds as opposed to being trampled, pushed, prodded while you're actually in your salat. So it's, you know, not worth it. For all the, the du'as, the supplications and things you're supposed to say, things you're supposed to read, I advise watching um, some YouTube material, reading. I mean, I, I watched a lot of Sheikh Omar Suleiman's lectures. He was fantastic and I just took notes on my phone and that was very helpful. I am not qualified to be telling you what to say, what to do. I'm just giving you advice more so on the logistics of the actual activities involved in the Hajj. And I'll, along the line, I'm giving you these tips, but for what to say and what, and what to, you know, make sure you're, um, you're performing Hajj as per the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, I would advise reading or watching material delivered by a Sheikh. And with that, your life is finished. So it shouldn't really take you longer than an hour to 90 minutes, depending on how crowded it is and what time of the day you choose to go. The, the times that I've found with the least crowded were the times just after the Hur and between Asr time, purely because it was so hot and it was actually uncomfortable for you to perform these activities. So if you're capable of bearing the heat and you have the energy to do so, those are the best times to go. And you can, I finished one in just over 30 minutes and it was really quick, quick and easy in and out. And that's your tawaf. Now following the tawaf, you need to do your say, so your safa and marwa. Now this was, this was another experience. Mind you, it wasn't nearly as bad as the tawaf, purely because you've, it's just less crowded. Um, and the only people who need to do their say are the people who have come to do their umrah. So if you're doing a nafal tawaf, you don't need to do your say. So that's, that's why it's just less crowded. Um, so you start at Safa, mind you, this, you make, uh, you make your supplications beforehand. And from Safa, you just beeline to Marwa. Now you've got these points where the green lights indicate the regions where you're supposed to pick up the pace. If you can do so, fantastic. But if you can't, just walk at a normal pace. It's just literally a straight line to Safa, straight line from, um, sorry, straight line to Marwa, then from Marwa back to Safa. So you do seven circuits again. So Safa to Marwa is one circuit, Marwa back to Safa is another circuit. So you do that seven times, not Safa to Marwa and then back to Safa, one circuit, no, no. Don't kill yourself and do that 14 times. It is just seven circuits and each length is one circuit. So once you finish that, you're almost there. All you need to do is either shave or trim your hair. Now it is, it is advised if you're here to do Umrah and Hajj together, 
to trim your hair for Umrah and then shave when you do your Hajj. So you trim your hair and you are golden. You can get out of your Ihram, which is the best feeling in the world because you've been wearing it since you were at Dubai airport or whatever, wherever it is that you came from. So it's a long time, a few days for some people, depending on how long you wait to do your Umrah. So taking that off and having that shower and changing into clean clothes is a sensational feeling. And also the feeling of having just completed your Umrah is phenomenal. So that's a, it's a really, really good time right there. So cherish it. And the days leading up to Hajj, once you've finished your Umrah, really conserve your energy, really try to get to a point where you're completely at peace with yourself, at peace with your surroundings, and make sure you are 120% ready to go. Do not do anything that will drive you to the point of sickness, drive you to the point of fatigue, drive you to the point of insanity. There is no need. It is advised by m most people to, once you've done your Umrah, relax and make sure you are in peak emotional, physical, mental state to perform your Hajj. Now, did Mr. Wise Guy take his own advice? No, well, to an extent, yes, but what, what I wanted to do, or what we wanted to do is maximize the amount of time we spent inside the actual Haram. Now, where it became a problem for us is when we realized how difficult it was to get from Shisha, the place we were staying, to the Haram. Now, it's only about seven kilometers, but what they do around Hajj time is they block so many roads that it makes it impossible for taxi drivers to get there, well, get there simply. They have to take all kinds of detours, all kinds of roads up mountains and all kinds of back streets to get you there. And the best part is they charge you through the nose. Like we were, like we heard of people paying upwards of 100 real per person for that seven kilometer trip to the Haram. That's insanity. So a car of five people, that's 500 reals. And you might be thinking reals, that's about $200. So it's a, it's a fair amount of money for a trip that shouldn't take you more than 15, 20 minutes. Right? So my advice is make sure you have a very basic understanding of the Arabic language to the point where you can negotiate with taxi drivers because that trip itself, particularly from Shisha to the Haram shouldn't cost you more than 40, 50 reals each way. Now we were paying between 25 and 40, but there were definitely people in our group paying double, triple, four times that amount. So be very careful. They do rot you. It is a time of the year where they make money that will last them for months. So there's nothing you can do about it. You can't get upset. Remember, you are in the Haram. You can't even intend to do sin, let alone actually commit the sin. So just play it smart. The, the trick is ask a few taxi drivers. You might get lucky and the first or the second one will be willing to offer you a decent rate to get to where you need to go. But it might take you half an hour. It might take you an hour to find someone who will who won't want to charge you a ridiculous amount but patience again patience 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 now an even better piece of advice outside of be being able to negotiate with these taxi drivers is to make sure that the location you're staying in is within walking distance to the haram so to the actual mosque you don't need to take a taxi to get there if that is the case you can easily get there for all of your five prayers without having to go through the, through the logistical nightmare of getting a taxi or even sometimes walking there in that heat because it's quicker to walk, quicker, cheaper, and much more practical to walk as opposed to dealing with this nonsense involved in, you know, taxis or private cars or Ubers or whatever it may be. So if you can make sure when you arrange your booking or when you choose the group that you're going with that the location that you're staying in is close to the Haram or within walking distance, then you, are, you avoid all of this mess. Because really, the only places you need to get through, you need to get to at, during these times, is to the mosque and then back to your hotel, wherever it is that you're staying. You don't have to worry about 
visiting this person, visiting that person, going to these shops, get, going to this restaurant. There's places to eat everywhere, facilities everywhere. So if you can get between A, your place of residence during the trip, and B, the mosque, so the harum, which is where you'll spend 80% of your time, ideally, then most of your problems are solved. Also, one other thing I'd quickly call out is about rideshare and people wanting to skirt the problem of taxis by using services like Uber. And another big one there, which is even bigger than Uber in Saudi, is Kareem. Um, I probably, I wouldn't bother, especially with Uber. Like, you can call an Uber, you can wait half an hour, an hour, and as soon as the person says they're a minute away, they'll just cancel the trip. So, waste of time. Kareem works a little bit better, but they will also charge you ridiculous prices. I know one guy from our group who got quoted 70, 80 reals for his trip and ended up paying in excess of, I think it was 300 reals. So you're always better locking in a fare with a private car or a taxi before you start driving um, or walking. Walking is always the best option if possible. In hindsight, the best use of time leading up to the actual days of Hajj would be one, relaxing as much as possible. Two, if you're in the vicinity of the Haram and you're within walking distance to the mosque, pray all your prayers there because the the multitude of the rewards is something you're never going to get. Three, I would highly advise that you write down, whether it's on a piece of paper, in a book, on your phone, the supplications, the du'as you're going to be reading on the days of Arafat, um, while you're doing your du'a for the actual Hajj. So if you've got that all written down and you read through it as the days go by, then you'll be far more comfortable during the actual Hajj and you won't freak out thinking, what am I going to read? What am I going to say? Um, and it's just one less thing to stress about. And trust me, one less thing is huge in the grand scheme of things when it comes to actually completing your Hajj successfully. So that's, that's my advice. Limit the distractions. A lot of people will want to go out, go visit restaurants, get some food, go shopping. That's one thing that is a real waste of time now. There are, I mean, there is the attraction to go shopping, buy gifts, buy things for yourself, <clears throat> for your family. If you are going to Medina as part of your Hajj package, I highly recommend saving all of your shopping for Medina. One, the shop owners and the business people in Mecca are absolutely horrid to deal with. They are a nightmare. They will give you grief. They they are completely irrational, completely unreasonable. So if you want to go ahead and deal with them, go right ahead, waste your time. They've got the same products in Medina, much nicer people to deal with. You'll get cheaper prices and you'll just be in a better state of mind when you're shopping as well. So really don't bother with shopping in Mecca. Just make sure you're spending this time in complete preparation. So the first day of Hajj is here. The day you transfer to Mina, your tents in Mina. Now, if you're with a big group, then you will travel with the group. They'll have buses allocated for the group and they will arrive at your hotel or apartment and pick you up and take you to Mina. Now, they work on a, um, it's not really a first come first serve basis. I think it's more of a lottery basis. So depending on um, what number you draw, your group will be transferred to Mina in that order. Now, the trip to Mina isn't far. The only problem is there is so much traffic going in the same direction that it takes a while. It takes some time. And there are some people that try to dodge this by walking, which is a pretty good idea. Um, it's about, depending on where you are from where we were, it was about an hour and a half walk as opposed to uh, half an hour to an hour on the bus. So if you're with a big group, it's better that you stay with your group for transfers like this because they need to account for um, each head in their group and if you go missing without letting your group leaders know then it's just causing headaches for everyone but if you're not with a group you're traveling independently then I would actually recommend trekking to Mina on foot it's I think it just adds to the overall Hajj experience and it's, it's not that far 
and it's actually quite enjoyable because there's actually um, a long tunnel that you can walk through so you're out of the su out of the sun for quite some time and it's 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 a good experience so if you can walk walk if you can't get on the bus the bus will take you directly to where your tent is located and this is where the real fun starts the very first thing I recommend you do when you get to your tents in Minna is familiarize yourself with the surroundings because you've got miles on miles of white tents. They all look the same. Yes, they've got different numbers, but they are borderline identical streets. So familiarize yourself with the location number. So each area will have a number. For example, we were in 44A. Make sure you do not forget that number. Write it down, take a picture, whatever you need to do to not forget it do that. Once you've done that, have a quick walk around the street and make sure you can find quick points of reference. So maybe a shop, maybe where the, the toilets or the bathrooms are. And once you find those, just make a mental note that this is in reference to where I enter the tent. Um, and that will help you immensely because trust me, one day you will walk out to do something. You might want to get some fresh air. You just want to leave the tent for a little bit and you'll walk back, you'll attempt to walk back and everything will look the same and it's just a nightmare getting back. There's hardly anyone there to help you. The officials will know depending on where, or well, what's written on your wristband as to where they guide you to, but trust me, people out there are borderline useless. So you wanna be as independent as possible. So make, have a good idea of where you are in your head and make sure you can retrace those steps back to your tent at any point in time. That is tip number one. Now, the glorious tents of Mina. You walk in there and all you see is 101 sofa beds. Now, when I say sofa beds, they're probably 50 centimeters wide, or maybe a little bit bigger. And it's just rows and rows of sofa beds, a couple of pillows and some very thin blankety things for you to wear. And this is it. This is all Mina is. All around you've got bathrooms and we'll get into the details what the bathrooms look like. You've got stalls that have your tea and coffee um, and yeah, just tents and tents and tents and tents and more tents. It's amazing. For day one in Mina, there, there are no real prescribed activities. Again, it's more a preparation day for the next day where you are transferred to Arafat, which is probably the most important day of your Hajj. So again, make sure you utilize this day very well for the sole purposes of preparation. Now, again, relax, get as much sleep as you can, get as much rest, recover. Um, also, it's a good time to familiarize yourself with uh, your group. If you haven't, get to know people, talk to each other. There's gonna be a lot of downtime. It's not, you're, no one's gonna be able to, you know, constantly recite and prepare their du'as for 24 hours. Doesn't work like that. You're gonna have a lot of downtime, relax, chill out. It's, it's, it's actually quite a fun time. You've got just a group of brothers there or sisters and you can, you know, share stories, share, share, share experiences so far, how you found the Hajj experience and really just wind down because the fun is about to start. You've probably already been warned or you've watched a video or someone's told you the toilets or the bathroom situation in Mina is an absolute disaster. So you need to do whatever you need to do to minimize the number of trips you need to make to those bathrooms. They are horrendous. They are nightmarish. They are the worst things in the world. They are so bad. And I'm not even exaggerating. They, they are actually bad. What they are is they are a one by two little room that has both a toilet and a shower. And sometimes the shower doesn't even work. So when you see these lines that are deceptively short and people are avoiding a certain cubicle, it's probably because the shower doesn't work. So don't think, oh, look, I'm Mr. Wise Guy. I'm gonna just jump into this shorter line here and have my shower. No, you're probably gonna go in there, turn the tap on and nothing. You got played fool. So yeah, a little one by two area with your toilet and shower. There's about, in a row of 10, 15 toilets, they'll have two of the normal conventional toilets where you sit down and you do your magic. 
The other toilets will be the squatting toilets. So the ones where you need to make sure that your quads, your thighs, your glute muscles are all on point, ready to squat down for as long as you need to because you don't want to have an accident in there because the place is filthy, it is disgusting. You are wearing a white haram. If that touches the nejis, the filth in that toilet, woo, you are done for. So be very careful. You want to minimize the number of trips you need to make. Make sure to take one of those hooks that you can hang over the door to hang your ihram on. Um, it usually does suffice to just actually hang the ihram over the door, but sometimes, you know, it's dirty, it's whatever it is, it's wet, and you don't want to do that. So having a hook does help. Also, one thing to be very careful of, and I got caught out, the actual locks on the door are very rusty and they're really sharp. So when you're opening and closing it, don't be, you know, too, careless i did i did um i didn't realize and i went to close it and it just cut me and it was rusty so unless you want to get a million tetanus shots be very careful of that outside of that minimize the number of showers you need well showers are fine take as many showers as you need um but it's just in general try to minimize the number of trips you need to take to the bathroom and also make sure that you don't eat any foods that will send you to the bathroom frequently or give you an upset tummy that will send you to the bathroom frequently. This is all common sense, right? Just eat dry foods, muesli bars, just things that will sustain your energy, get you over the line. You don't need to fill your stomach up. It's just not what you need right now. You just need bare minimum sustenance, good sources of energy to get you through the day. That is crucial, that is critical. If you screw this up and you end up spending <laughs> half your day in line waiting for the bathroom and then inside the bathroom, then you're gonna have a rough time. Mina is also the place where a lot of people fall sick. Now, the reason for that is you've got these tents that are really hot, air conditioning systems, fans that have never been serviced. They've got dust from the times of the Sahaba on there. It is just a nightmare and they are circulating the air that people cough into and it's just, you know, food scraps everywhere. It's just a, a live site for growing bacteria and it's nasty. It's disgusting. So people get sick, they get dehydrated and it's usually the place that you know, if you're gonna, if something's gonna happen to you, it'll happen in Mina. And it's okay, it happens to everyone. You try your best to avoid it. Make sure you keep, you know, you keep hydrated. If you need vitamin C to keep your immune levels up, take your vitamin C. Um, anything else you need to take, your medications, make sure you stay on top of them because you don't wanna fall sick today. Of all days to fall sick, you don't wanna fall sick on the first day of Mina and then the day following in Arafat. Any other day you've got a bit of a buffer to work around and you know, just give your body a bit of time to rest and recuperate. But this is go time. This is when you need your body at peak, 110%. You need to be able to go, go, go. So make sure you stay on top of all of that and make sure you're, you know, keep your hygiene up. The one thing that really got to me was people lack very basic hygiene. When they cough or when they sneeze, it's not about you know, covering your mouth or just doing the, the basic thing of not wanting to spread your germs. It's who can cough the loudest, who can sneeze and spread the liquid and the gunk that comes out of their mouth the furthest into the air. It's like, the hell is wrong with all of you? Are you just like, you know, just a bunch of animals? Honestly, like, it is rare to find someone who will cover their mouth when they cough or sneeze during Hajj. It is a sickness. It's so bad. It's disgusting. It is the reason why everybody gets sick it's because basic hygiene is not followed. It's just honestly worse than a zoo. You've got people from all walks of life, people with all kinds of conditions, all kinds of sicknesses, and they spread them like wildfire because they can't do the basic thing of covering their mouths when they cough, washing their hands when they use the bathroom. Simple stuff. You think it was, it's, you know, it's just, you wouldn't even have to think about it. No, that stuff, is not done and it just hampers the entire ummah because people get sick, people struggle, and nobody learns from their mistakes. 
And I'm not going to hamper on this point for too long because it'll happen to you when you go. It's happened to everyone when they've gone. It's something that doesn't change. It's something that won't change. So you know what we do? We live with it like all other things in Hajj and you move on. I said I wasn't going to hamper the point, but one thing I saw that was really just mind boggling. And this was, this was our group. Like we're coming from Australia and the groups around us are from the UK, America, and you'd think they should know all these things. These are like, you know, hammered into you at primary school, even before that pre like preschool, childcare, whatever it is. In the alleyways of Mina between your tents, you've got these little walkways. And that's where all the rubbish is piled up and the food scraps are. And when they, you know, the guys come to clean out the rubbish, all of the liquid from the garbage bag comes out and just festers on the ground. People actually walk on that without shoes, walk to the bathrooms without shoes, go to the bathrooms, step into the toilets, not wearing shoes, then come back to your tent that is carpeted with their dirty feet and... The rest is history, man. So that first night in Mina, try to get as much sleep as you can. I remember getting about probably an hour of broken sleep. I had one guy's arm on top of me. It was just hot. The fan was just blowing all kinds of dust into my face so I couldn't breathe. It was, it was a struggle, but if you can get as much sleep as possible, now, one thing that will really help you if you're staying in Mina for a few days, even after the days of um, Arafat, is when the time of Fajr approaches, so maybe an hour, an hour or an hour and a half before the Adhan, go and make your door, or use the bathroom. Because if you want to go five minutes beforehand, 10 minutes beforehand, even 30 minutes beforehand, the lines are just ridiculous. So to dodge the crowd, Set your alarm a little bit earlier, an hour earlier, hour and a half earlier, get everything done, come back to your tent and you can relax until the point where they make the event, then you pray and then you are golden. Trust me, it sounds so small, so almost irrelevant, but it'll, it'll be the best start to your day. Do it. Just listen to me. Just listen, please. I beg you. Something that happened to me in Mina that Honestly, I don't, I don't even know if it tested my patience. I don't know if it just left me so baffled, so speechless. I was brushing my teeth before Fajr one morning and they've got these taps just outside the bathroom. So they're connected to the bathrooms, but it's just, you know, just a, an express lane for people that just want to brush their teeth through their window without needing to use the actual toilets or the showers. So I was standing there brushing my teeth and there was a guy to my side um, not at one of the taps, just casually brushing his teeth beside me. And he, you know, accumulates all of this, you know, toothpaste and saliva and whatnot in his mouth. And he proceeds to spit right onto my foot. And I look up at him and this seven foot brother from Turkmenistan with half of his gut hanging out from his t-shirt is so unfazed. I'm, th I'm thinking, you just spat on my foot, man. And that's not just water. That's a whole heap of things that I don't want to get into. And you're not even going to apologize or even acknowledge what you've done. He didn't flinch. He finished brushing his teeth and he walked away. I was just dumbfounded. This is, this is what tested me. This, these are the, these are the acts. These are the moments that almost broke me. It wasn't the walking. It wasn't the heat. It wasn't the physical intensity. It was the acts of the Muslim Ummah that were just, I had like, you know, it just made no sense to me. Like I would not expect this from the lowest of people. This is just, I'm going to stop there. And there were people dropping dead, like, dehydrated, just collapsing to the floor in Mina. And that, that moment where the guy spat on my foot was more memorable than people dying. Like it's, I just, I don't have words for this. This, this is just only in Mina, only in Mina. So the next morning you're preparing to move to Arafat for the day. So Arafat, you spend between Dhuhr and Maghrib 
and that is the most critical component of your hatch. So you want to maximize the output during this time. This is a time where you cannot falter. You cannot, like everything you've done is leading up to this moment. The buses will take you from the tents in Mina to Arafat. Now, again, this is not, not a very far journey. It, depending on what time you leave and which order your group has been assigned, it'll take about half an hour to an hour. I mean, your bus can break down, all kinds of things can happen, which might, it may extend the journey. It might delay your entry into Arafat a little bit, but you'll get there around the whole time, just after the whole time, rest assured. I would advise against walking from Mina to Arafat, just because they may block roads. And if you are part of a group and you've ditched the group and you're going by yourself and you run into a, a scenario where they've blocked a road and the officials aren't letting you through, you're gonna have a bad time because the group's already gone um, and the officials are very unreasonable when it comes to, you know, letting you through when they've blocked something. So best to stick with the group because you don't want to miss what's about to what's about to come. What's about to happen in Arafat is unmissable. If you're lucky enough to arrive in Arafat before the whole time, it's actually a really good idea to get some sleep. Either use the shower, freshen up, get some sleep, get a meal in, and as soon as Duhur time comes, you'll pray Duhur and Asr shorten and combine, and from that point onwards, you want to be able to make as many Dua as possible until it comes to Maghrib time, which is the time where you will head towards Muzdalifah. This window of opportunity is absolute gold. Do not waste it. Do not waste it waiting in line for the bathroom. Do not waste it talking. I mean, there is a great temptation. You're in a big tent surrounded by friends you've made over the, the past few days from your group. People are going to want to talk. I saw some brothers sleep through the entire day of Arafat. It is mind boggling. What are you doing? You don't get opportunities like this. Sometimes this is actually once in a lifetime. So take every advantage. Make sure your du'as are ready, even if they're not ready, even if you're preparing them right before the whole time and you're going into, you're going past the whole time preparing, that's fine because you're not going to spend seven, eight hours of pure supplication. It's hard. I mean, more often than not, people haven't done anything like this before. You might do an, an hour of du'a and then you're, you know, you're all du'a'ed out and you need a break. So you might take a little break, have some water, stretch your legs, come back and you continue on. Just make sure you maximize your output. You need to make sure that every single moment you have, you attempt to use it in supplicating. In your, the connection to your Lord has to be like this. Do not worry about what the guy next to you is doing, what the group beside you is chanting, what other people are up to. Forget about them. This is the moment where you need to be selfish. It's just you and your Lord get the most out of it. You'll see some people going up Mount Arafat, climbing to the top. I mean, if you want to do it, power to you. Personally, I think you're better off, you know, using the time, investing in your dua, making as much as possible, as many times as possible. There is no, well, I mean, you can go on and do your own reading, but from what I've read and what I've been told, there is no real reward for going up the mountain. I mean, the sermon itself was given at the bottom of the mountain. So people that waste their time scaling all the way to the top and then takes them even more time getting back down. It's just, there are better things to do. And the highlight of my trip came on this day. While we were in our tents, we heard the heavens open. It started to rain. And when I say rain, the rain started pelting down in Arafat. This is unheard of. It rained for hours. We went outside and it was just the most unbelievable time of my life. I lost myself for that entire period of time. I, it's, it was, I, have, I haven't got words. I didn't have words then, I don't have words now. It, I'm sure you've seen videos of it. I'm sure people have told you about it. It's something that 
People have gone to Hajj multiple times, have never seen, never experienced. Everyone was in shock. Everyone was just amazed at what just happened. It was truly, truly spectacular. Then the rain died down and you start to, you know, you feel, you feel yourself again and you're slowly coming back to your senses and you realize you've got a drenched ihram on you. It weighs five times more than it did originally. And you're like, oh God, what do I do with this? Then it hits you. I brought a second ihram along. It's like... So you head to the bathroom, you change into the new ihram and it's, everything's rosy again. So, good tip, bring a second ihram with you. And this is where you want to bring one that is a little bit lighter. So I had one that was quite thick and one that was light. So putting that second ihram on felt absolutely amazing. It just, I just felt like completely refreshed and ready to continue until Maghrib time. And honestly, the day of Arafat, the Yom Arafat was I, the best day of my life. So then Maghrib time comes along and you just, this, this sense of, you know, just emptiness. I mean, Arafat, it's, it's, it's over, it's, it's done. If you, didn't, if you didn't get what you needed to get out of it, then you need to wait till next year, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20. It's, it's, it's all gone. And it's just, it's mixed emotions. It's people slowly unwind. We're just packing your stuff. You're getting ready to move to Muzdalifa. You, you know, you might get something to eat now. You might go to the bathroom. Um, we sat down in a group of group of friends and we just had a conversation, just talking about football, talking about nonsense. And it was just, it was just a good, good, another good time to just relax and chill before going to Muzdalifa because that was about to get even more interesting. Now, upon approaching Muzdalifa on the bus, like this is just a completely mountainous region and you can see these specks of people just, you know, dispersed along, along the mountain. And I'm thinking, this is going to be sensational. This, like, this is, <laughs> I'm gonna sleep outside here tonight. And we disembark from the bus and we're walking around looking for a place, an empty, an empty spot to set up camp. And when I say set up camp, you're just, you know, you're taking your little piece of uh, a little mattress, which is about that thick, you're laying it down and you're, uh, you know, you're getting cozy because that's all you've got. Now, the whole point of Muzdalifa is just to get a couple of hours of sleep before the next day. Now, it's, it's honestly, it's like a T-Rex slumber party. There are people everywhere. There are, it's just nothing like you've ever experienced before. Unless maybe you're, you know, you're very used to, you know, being in the outback in the wilderness. But again, it's very different because you don't have a million other people beside you. It's just, honestly, like I thought going into that and seeing all of that, I wasn't going to sleep for a second. But surprisingly, I knocked out for a couple of hours and I, and I woke up thinking, oh my God, there's a lot of dust in my mouth, but I actually went to sleep. So it's not too bad. And when I did wake up, it actually, you know, I, I got to thinking this, this picture that I've got around me right now is unlike anything I've seen before. And it's supposed to, you know, draw, draw a parallel to the, the day of resurrection. So the day everyone is resurrected and it's Yom Qiyamah and everyone is there looking all disheveled and, you know, just out of place, ready to, you know, front, stand in front of your Lord and, you know, account for everything you've done in this world, you actually see it. You get, you get, you get a taste for it. And it's just, honestly, it'll, it's, again, left me speechless. Quick piece of advice from Muzdalifa. I, I watched a lot of videos and read, read a few things and people were saying, don't stress about collecting your stones for the Jamarat in Muzdalifa because you can do it in Mina, you can do it anywhere in Mecca, really. I, I think Muzdalifa was definitely the easiest place to do it. And it takes about 10 minutes and you've got 70, 80 stones. You've got enough for spares. So definitely just spend 10, 15 minutes, grab all the stones you need. Don't go grabbing golf ball size stones because you're gonna do damage. You're gonna hurt someone. You need the tiniest of stones, the size of a chickpea. Gather them, 
put them in a little bag or whatever you're going to collect them in and just get it out of the way. It's actually really hard to collect them in Mina. Depending on where your tent is situated, there are hardly any loose stones around, so best to do it in Muzdalifa. So from Muzdalifa, you'll make your way back to Mina. Now, depending on your situation, again, you can either take a bus with your group or you can walk. There are quite a few people actually walk from Muzdalifa to Mina. Now, it'll take you a couple of hours. My, In my opinion, I'd probably, depending on what you want to do, so if you have plans to do your tawaf that very same day, then I'd probably advise against walking and maximizing or just making sure your energy reserves are as high as possible. So don't waste your efforts or your energy walking to Mina because you don't really gain much from it besides, you know, adding to your, to your experience. So if you can, wait for the group. The bus will take you back to Mina. And then there are designated times for each group to visit the Jamrat. Well, I thought there was, and then when we got there, it was just, felt like a free-for-all. The walk to Jamrat from Mina was actually not too bad. It took about, mm, I think just under an hour and a half. And so long as you had an umbrella, it was fine. I mean, some people collapsed from dehydration, the heat, like you just see people dropping like flies. Uh, make sure you've, you know, you carry a lot of water with you. You've got your umbrella. Don't, don't be silly. Don't attempt to, you know, just pretend you're stronger than you are. The heat will get to you. The exhaustion will get to you. So make sure you're prepared. Um, once you actually get to the Jamarat, this is when you see all kinds of madness. So there's three Jamarat, right? So you've got the the small, medium, and large, just like you're about to order a meal at McDonald's. This day, you only need to visit the large Jamarat. So Jamarat al that's the only one you need to stone. When you approach, as soon as people see the Jamarat, so the Jamarat itself is actually a very long elliptical structure. Um, and it's like a, a big brick wall. As soon as people see it, they lose their mind as if Iblis is standing right there in front of them. And they grab their rocks and start hurling them from ridiculous distances. And this is where it gets dangerous, right? Because you've got elderly people, you've got young people, you've got people who think they are Brett Lee and can throw the ball 70 meters across the outfield and hit the Jamarat. And it's just, it actually turns into a bloodbath. Like you have people who end up throwing their stones and knocking head, the heads of people standing at the front, towards the front of the Jamarat, and it's just madness. This is not, this, it's not the point. And what people don't realize is this is not a 2D structure. It is a big structure. You can walk around the crowds to the other side of the Jamarat where it's actually empty. There is no one there. I end, we ended up finding a spot where we were literally throwing with minimal effort, just like this. There you go, simple. And you, no one is in danger, no one's getting hurt. It takes you all of 10 seconds and you're done. There is no need for your moment of insanity, just complete lunacy. You don't need to hurt anyone. And this was actually a tip I got from Sheikh Umar Suleiman where he said, literally just walk around the crowd and you will find an empty spot. Completely empty. It's just people do crazy things in Hajj. It's just, again, one of those things that you need to accept and move on. You can tell them a million times over, they'll continue to do it. Now, the four rituals that need to be completed before you can enter or exit out of the state of Ihram is your Tawaf al ifada your Jamrat al-Aqaba, which you've just done, your sacrifice, which if you're going in a big group will be done on your behalf, and the shaving of the hair. Now, with the sacrifice, the group will generally, they'll, they'll tell you before you leave, generally in Mina the day before, that expect to have your sacrifice done by say 11 a.m. or midday or whatever it is, and they'll let you know. So around that time, you can safely assume that your sacrifice has been done. If 200 people go to the group leader at the one time and go, has my sacrifice been done? No, you can safely assume that the sacrifice has been done by midday or give it till 1 p.m. if you want to include a buffer in there. And from that point on, you can go and get your head shaved. Now for me, shaving my head was actually quite a daunting experience because I'd never done it before. 
And the way they do it, we went to one of these government operated uh, barbershops or whatever you want to call them. And you give them the money, they give you a ticket and one guy just grabs your arm and just, you know, drags you in there, sits you down. And I just, you know, I want to tell them, you know, just make sure you use a new blade. Make sure you, you know, you take it slow, man. I don't want to have a million different cuts on my head, um, but no, nothing. Sit down. He sprays the whole bottle of alcohol on you. I couldn't open my eyes. I didn't know what was happening. And then two minutes later, I got a pat on my back. You're done, mate. Get out. So here I am just walking out, you know, just trying to brush the alcohol out of my eyes. It's stinging. It's crazy. My wife looks at me. She's like, oh my God. I, you know, wash my face, wash whatever soap, whatever is left on me. And then, and then you just, again, it's that feeling that you can't describe. It's, it's surreal. It's just magical. So once you've shaved your head, you've done three of the four acts. So you've done your Jamratul Aqaba, you've, the sacrifice has been done on your behalf and you've shaved. So anything left for you to do is your Tawaf al now, this means you can take your ihram off. So you're not completely out of ihram, but everything that was um, haram for you while you were in the state of ihram is no longer haram except for intimacy with your spouse. So it's, it's a great feeling taking that ihram off. I mean, it's probably even better than the first time you took it off after Umrah because this time you've spent some time in Mina, you've spent some time in Arafat, and you've slept in it in Muzdalifah. So it's manky, it's all kinds of things, and it's a great feeling to have a shower and to take that off. This is where the shisha location came in absolutely clutch. It was sensational. So the place where you had our heads shaved was very close to the Jamarat. So as soon as you come down from level three and you walk a few hundred meters, um, there's a few barber shops, you get your head shaved. Now the shisha location is another 15 minute walk from here. So it's very convenient to walk straight there, have a shower, change into a, a fresh set of clothes and just relax and unwind. The game plan for us was actually to delay doing our tawaf to the next day because you could imagine all of those people, every single person who would come to perform Hajj, all approximately 2.4 million or whatever number it was, the majority of them are going to want to do that off that very same day and complete their Hajj. We didn't have that time pressure. We had quite a few days in Mecca after the Hajj period. So we were going to delay it to the next day, wait for the crowds to die down and then do our off with slightly, you know, less hustle and bustle. So that day we spent the majority of the daytime in the shisha area so we got a nap i don't even think i got a nap in i had a shower had some lunch and then we just hung out with some friends and the only condition if you're returning to mina is that you spend the majority of the night in mina so we headed out back towards mina i think it was around just after a shout time and we were going by foot so it was an hour and a half walk by foot which was which wasn't too bad at all because at that point you'd had the whole day to the majority of the day to relax you're not in ihram anymore uh, you've showered you're i mean you're as refreshed as you're gonna be during this trip so the walk wasn't actually bad at all quite enjoyable actually so you get back to mina you have your meal and you try to get as much sleep as possible again did i sleep <laughs> no but if you can maximize the amount of sleep but at this point it's not really as critical because the next day all you need to do is go back to the jamara and then stone all three and i mean that you can do at your own pace so you don't have to rely on the on the group anymore so you can go at whatever point don't go before the hot time because you need to go after the hot time so anytime after the hut, you can go and stone the three jamara and then come back to mina and if you're going to spend the following day in mina again like the day before you need to spend the majority of the night in Mina. Otherwise, if you're leaving, you need to leave Mina before Maghrib time. Going, going into the Hajj, my intention or our intention was to spend all three days in Mina. So just follow the exact way of the Sunnah and just write it out. I mean, it was, it was just one extra day. 
So we did the first day, we did the second day. So we've stoned the all all three jumbled out twice already. And at this point, the condition or the state of Mina has deteriorated so much. So you could imagine all of the food, all of the bathroom activities and the, the, the waste products that manifest and just, you know, turn into this, I'm, you know, I'm really setting the scene for you here and I'm, sh it's not pretty, it smells, it's a breeding site for sickness. I just, to the point where I hadn't slept in two, three days, I couldn't, like it was, I, I just felt my body just giving up and it got to the point where I'm like, I can't physically spend another day or even if I did, I'd just get to the point where I'd fall sick and I'd have to render the next few days in Mecca useless. So I made the call to leave Mina on that second day before Maghrib and not come back for the third day, which is perfectly fine. I mean, it's up to you what you want to do. If you want to spend all three days power to you, then go ahead and do it. Um, I, that was my plan, but the state of Mina just broke me. It was too much for me. Call me soft, call me whatever you want. It's, I mean, it's every man for himself out there. Just do what's best for you. Don't, you know, don't just disregard the fact that there is going to be plenty of time to spend in the Haram after that. So you don't want to be sick. You don't want to be ill. You don't want to need to visit any of the hospitals. So just play it smart. And just before I forget about the actual Allah for the Hajj, so it's Allah for Lifada, we came back to do it the the day after we did the Jamrat al Aqaba the first time. So the day after that, we were in Shisha, we, a, f a group of us went to the Haram to do our Allah. Um, we left the, the bigger group. I mean, the bigger group were planning on doing it, I think, the same day, but just a bit later. We just thought it'd be easier logistically to get it done out of the way ourselves and then make our own way back to Mina from there. Now, the hope or the expectation was the crowds would be a bit less when we got there on the second day. <laughs> it's just as if it multiplied as the days went by. Like it just got busier and busier and busier and busier. So we got there, crowds are just insane. We did out a laugh on the very top level, um, got that done. It felt great to get that over and done with that meant every, all the rukun of the hajj was complete and there was really nothing left to do um, besides go back to spend the extra couple of days in Mina to do your stoning which again was optional and that's that once you finish up in Mina you transfer back to your apartment or hotel whatever it may be if your package um, ends there and you're traveling back to your homelands then it's a it's, it's mixed emotions. It's for us, we were spending a few more days in Mecca. So we had about another five days after the, the Hajj, the real Hajj days that we were spending in Mecca. And I spent that time just maximizing the number of Tawaf. So I tried to do about three to four a day. It sounds crazy, but if you, if you're strategic about the timing, so I would minimize the amount of sleep I got in a day. I really didn't care for sleep during these days. So around 1 a.m. or 1.30, I'd go and do one tawaf before Fajr. After that, if I had the energy, I'd do one more or I'd go back home and get a couple of hours of sleep, then come back um, for Dhuhr and then do one tawaf either before or after Dhuhr and then either spend the time in the Haram or go back to the hotel again. This time we transferred to a hotel that was on the doorstep, so inside the clock tower, so we could go and come from the Haram with ease. So I do one either before or after Asr or I just wait and I'd rather do one before Maghrib and then one after Isha. Some days I'd get two, some days I'd get three, some days I'd get four. Depending on my energy levels, depending on how busy the crowds were, depending on how you know unbearable the heat was, you just, you just play it smart and maximize again the output of these remaining days you have in Mecca because remember all your acts of worship are multiplied this could you never know this could be the only opportunity you get to visit this kingdom the it's just cherish it do as much as you can do not waste time
It's again, it's even easier to waste time during these days because there is no real obligation to do any of these things. Um, but yeah, just keep it in the forefront of your mind. Your time is limited. The days go very quickly. So yeah. Now I know I've already spoken about that the laugh and some of the difficulties involved when you're trying to negotiate all of that traffic and people are pushing and shoving and doing all kinds of things that just, you know, drive you to the, the ends of your frustration. And there's, it's just, it's even worse when it's not hedge, hedge time. And there's, you go, you go during the times of the day where you expect the crowd to be less and the crowd is actually less. So you go between the hood and Asura and it's really hot. And on the ground floor, there's all these, there's gaps, there's actual gaps in the crowd. So you can actually see pockets of space where you can breathe while doing your tawaf. And trust me, that's, that's a luxury. So during those times, you'll have people who still run into you, bump you, even though there's three, four meters either side of you. I mean, there was one particular guy who came past me and shoved me. I mean, I'm like, I'm not gonna move that easily, but it was a decent shove. Turned around and gave me a smile and I was like, dude, what are you, what are you doing? There's so much room either side of me. That was so unnecessary. He came back for the second circuit and did the same thing. And here I am thinking, all right, my, like I'm about my, my fuse is just here. I'm going to snap at this man. And let me tell you the third time he came around, he did the same thing. What did I do? I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. Best believe he did it four times. The fourth time I snapped, I just shoved the guy. I shoved him and I said, dude, he probably didn't understand the thing I was saying, but I, I gestured. I said, there is space either side of me. You're, you're being a complete idiot. You don't have to bump into me. You don't have to, you know, bump into anyone for that matter. Just, just get a grip. He just, you know, even though I shoved him, I mean, I shoved him quite hard. He just looked back at me and smiled and kept going. These are the characters, the characters that you deal with. I was constantly used as a means to clear the path for people while doing tawaf. So they would grab their hands and dig them into my back and push me through the crowd so I could clear the way for them. And you turn around and they just smile and give you a, hey man, thanks for the service. And I'm just like, no, oh, I'm ready to backhand you right now. But you're, you're, it's while you're doing an act of worship, you are, you are supplicating right then and there while they are doing this to you. So you can't swear at them. You can't belt them. You can't backhand them as bad as you want to. You need to keep it together. This is the real test. Oh, well, the real, that was the real test for me. And every single time I did it, Allah, I had an encounter like this. And sometimes once, sometimes twice, sometimes every single circuit, I encountered a, a moron. So what you need to do is you just need to keep it together. If you are someone like me and you get frustrated very easily, when it's really busy, go up to the top floor. It's less crowded. When it's hotter, come to the ground floor because it's quieter. There's gaps in the crowd and you can be closer to the Kaaba without having to, you know, fight with every second person. I mean, I was just at one point, I was just like, hmm. It's crazy, man. It's just crazy. Once our time in Mecca was up, that was it. So we were transferring to Medina and let me tell you, after those five or six days in Mecca, I was so ready to leave the place. Not because of, you know, the, where I was. It was the people that were, that were around me, the pilgrims, the actual, the locals. Everyone just made life as difficult as it uh, could possibly be. They, they just drove me absolutely insane. I needed to get out of there. I couldn't, I couldn't stay there any longer. It is a place where you can't, you know, it is, it is the haram. Everything is restricted. So you yourself, you're already restricted. And when people are pushing you to the, you know, the, your wits end constantly, you're just, you're going to snap. So I needed to go. And Medina was an absolute blessing. It was hands down the best place on earth. Let me tell you, if I could snap my fingers and go back there and never have to leave there, I would do it in a heartbeat. It was amazing. I won't go into Medina for this video, but if you want me to talk about Medina in another video, 
more than happy to do so. There's only good things about Medina. I don't, I can't think of a negative, like, even though it's been a few days since we've come back, I can't think of anything bad about that place. I've honestly, I've found myself just constantly longing to go back there. Just please, Lord, send me back there. I, I need to go back. I mean, but yeah, we can, we can discuss that in another video. If you... Actually, I'll touch on one thing about Medina because outside of the, the Prophet's Mosque and the beautiful people and, just, you know, the, the, the fresh air and the, um, just the chillaxed vibe about the place, the only real call out for me in Medina was the visit to the Rolda. So that, that was intense. So we went around two hours after he shouted. So it was around 11.30. And it was, again, one of the most unbelievable things I've experienced for so many different reasons. So initially in the line, the guards usually block sections and let people go section by section. As soon as they turn their heads, you have a crowd of just wild animals, just pushing, shoving, just with zero regard for anything or anyone in front of them, trying to get to the front of the line. <sighs> You're here to visit the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Bakr, Umar are both beside him and you are acting like the lowest of human beings. You can't even have the most basic decency. You will push over anyone and everyone. And what I encountered was like, I still, like I think back and I just, I just, I laugh. When you actually get inside, inside the roller, the, the whole point is to pray your two rakat, make a dua, and be on your way. No, 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 no. You have people praying 48 rakat. They don't want to leave. They don't want to go out. They realize that there's a million other people waiting to get in and to have the same opportunity that they've just had. But no, there's no consideration for anyone else. It's just them and themselves. That's all that matters. So they'll continuously pray, and the guards do a really terrible job of making sure people have ample opportunity to visit and once they've done what they need to do, completed their duties, uh, escorted out in an orderly fashion. No, they just let you in there like a herd of animals and let you back out like a herd of animals. And you, like, I had someone, when I went to pray, they put their shoes, not in a plastic bag, just shoes, exposed shoes, on that carpet right in front of me. I had no place to pray. The shoes were there. What do you say to someone like this? Like, what, what do you do in that situation? You can't, like, as much as I want to just punch this guy in the throat. I'm standing 10 feet from the grave. There was one guy who was in sujood and someone managed to... I mean, this is really tight confines. Like, there is no room. Like, you're... Attempting to stand straight, but you're sideways because there's just people all over. Now, one guy's in sujood and someone's just, you know, flicked his head. He's gotten up from sujood and started cursing. Cursing, like properly cursing. This guy's still in prayer and he's cursing. And he had to be reminded that the grave was right beside him. The look on his face was hilarious when they reminded him and he came to his senses. But this is the kind of, you know, environment and this is how people behave. It's, it's honestly, it's disgusting. Like you cannot get the most out of acts, acts like this when you're in this environment. It's just so hard. You can't do much about it. It's the people, it's, it's not facilitated properly. So you just do whatever you can. You, again, you persevere, just remain patient, do what you need to do. If you can help out others who are, you know, the elderly who are not able to push other people around, just make sure you, if you can protect them when people are just pushing and shoving like absolute idiots. Um, and yeah, just, just, just keep calm, keep calm. That's a wrap. Now I'll put a nice little ribbon on this video and just give you a couple of my top tips. So these are just all around tips for 
for Hajj. Now, as I said at the start, the, f the very first thing you need to do before you set out on this journey is you need to make sure that you've, you've told yourself and you continuously remind yourself throughout the journey that I need to be patient. I need to be patient. I'm going to be exposed to things that are just out of this world and I'm going to have my patience tested. So I need to remain patient and I need to set my expectations for the logistics of the trip really, really low. Like, again, you need to expect the worst. So when you get anything better than the worst, you are, you know, so that's that there. The other thing I really, really wanted to, I, I wanted to put this at the very start of the video for people that are planning on going to Hajj or, you know, say I'll go in 20 years inshallah, or, you know, when I'm more settled in life or when I've got four kids and paid the house off, that, that mindset is actually toxic. Like, don't, no. as soon as you have the physical means, as soon as you have the financial means, go and do it. It is the single best thing that you can do. Take it from me. I, I don't have words to describe what I experienced, but as soon as I returned home, I just, I was begging to go back, begging to go back. And the other thing to take note of is, and I got asked by a lot of people over there, why have you come on this journey so young? Like, wh what was the hurry to come here? And to be honest, I was quite shocked that I'd be asked that question. But for me, the mentality was, I want to be able to experience this, this journey and have it transform me so I can live the, the greater chunk of my life as this transformed person. And God willing, I want to be able to go back to Hajj every single year from now on. That now it's, it's an addiction. It's, it's a feeling that you can only accurately describe once you've done it and you've experienced it for yourself. So everyone's sitting on their hunches, just waiting for the right time. Now is the right time. Get it done. If you have the means, do not delay. Young, old, whoever you are, please, I, I beg of you to make it a priority. Another key thing for Hajj is if you're going with a group, you want to make sure you're as independent of the group as possible. You don't want to have to depend on them to say, oh, this is what you need to do next. And as part of this ritual, you need to say this, or you need to perform this. That will, that is actually dangerous because you'll get to points where you lose the group or they go missing, you can't find them. And you're in the middle of doing something. So you're not gonna go, ah, oh, hold on. I'm gonna wait until I can find them, locate them, and then I'll continue. No, it doesn't work like that. You need to make sure that you've done your reading, you've done your research, you know exactly what you need to do when, you've written it down, it's available on your phone whenever you need it because you're gonna get separated from the group. And depending on them too much is a recipe for disaster. So ideally, you wanna be able to complete all the acts of Hajj that are required of you independently. The other thing I'd recommend is form a small group of friends out of the bigger group that you're traveling with and use that as a group that you do things together with. You go to the Jamarat together with them. You spend your time in Mina together with them. So you can constantly remind each other the things that are important when someone's slipping on their patience or when they start backbiting or they start talking things that they're not supposed to talk, you've got a constant reminder and it works both ways. That support network is really, really helpful. And for all of the things you need to say or do, the, the specific du'as, the specific points of the Hajj, there are plenty of books. If you're not a reading person, there are plenty of videos out there by qualified people. Go and listen to them, digest them, learn them, memorize them, and you will be in good stead. And trust me, there isn't a lot to do. Like when you're doing your tawaf, there are specific things you need to say and you're just repeating them for each circuit. When you're doing your say, there's the same, same, same applies. So there isn't much you need to learn. If you spend a good month or two reading and watching these videos, you will be more than ready for Hajj. It's, it's more about when you actually get there and you're physically there and you're overwhelmed by your surrounds that you will need to 
you know, reference back to your notes or your some something that you've jotted down on a piece of paper just to, you know, just to jog your memory. But actually learning them, there's they're very few and they're not they're not hard at all. Another thing is when you're looking for a group to go to Hajj with or to perform Hajj with, one thing I would recommend in hindsight is, and we did this, which was really awesome, was going to Medina after Mecca. So there are a lot of groups, and I think the majority of groups go to Medina before Mecca. So they go to Medina and they do their ziyara and then they come to Mecca, do their hajj and they return to their homelands. If you go to Medina after the hajj period, after all that madness, you get to experience the most chilled out place in the world. It is amazing. And the crowds aren't bad at all. If you're staying in a hotel near, nearby to the masjid, you're literally just a five minute walk away. It is going to be the most amazing thing you experience. So when looking for a package, if a package offers Medina after Mecca, I would definitely have that as a big plus. Also, like I mentioned earlier in the video, <clears throat> make sure you are familiar with where you are staying in Mecca. You ideally, ideally want to be within walking distance of the Haram, the Masjid. So you don't want to have to rely on taxis or other forms of transportation to get to the Haram. Because during Hajj times, it's just madness. But if you're within walking distance, 5, 10, 15 minute walk, whatever it is, you are, trust me, you are well ahead of the pack. Other people struggle, we struggled. It is one of the biggest struggles of Hajj. So make sure you're familiar with where you're being, you know, where your hotel is for the, for the duration of your stay in Mecca. In, in regards to what to pack and what to, what to bring, there are plenty of videos that have already been made that you can watch. I mean, some people go over the top. I'm happy to run through what, what I packed. I mean, I tried to, you know, pack as light as possible. Um, there's everything is available there, but if you want me to, you know, do a video on that, go a little deeper on that, I can do that. But I was able to watch some videos and I got some pretty, some pretty good tips. So definitely check them out. And one thing I've remembered, definitely pack two ihrams for guys. Grab one that's a bit thicker and one that's a bit, bit lighter. It'll come in handy, even if you don't get rained on like we did. The ihrams get, they get really dirty and you don't want to waste time just washing them. If one gets dirty, just chuck it out, put the new one on and it, you'll feel amazing. Trust me, it's, the lighter ones are not too heavy to carry around and I, I bought one last minute for about 30 rials just in, in, the, in the shisha area. So you don't even have to bring it from wherever you're coming from because I know they're a bit more expensive. So in Australia, they were about $70, $80. This one's about 30 rials. So just, you can pick one up just before the days of Hajj and you are sorted. Food, now this is a pretty, pretty important, important one, um, especially during the days of Mina, Arafat, Muzdalifa, where you want to minimize your trips to the bathroom, where you don't want to fall sick. For that, we packed just, you know, just dry foods, just muesli bars, nuts, and simple things like when you have meals, curries and whatnot that's been sitting in the heat and you don't know what's gone off or what's bad, I would avoid it. Um, I tried to avoid it as much as possible and muesli bars were awesome. So just pack some, um, maybe a few boxes and it'll do you good and it'll also help out some people beside you and around you from your group. Lastly, maximize the acts of worship that you do. I mean, throughout the day, just doing your fard prayers will get you hundreds of thousands of rewards when you do them as jama'ah inside the haram. So really take every opportunity to do that. I mean, you can watch your Netflix when you get back to Melbourne or wherever it is that you're headed home. Just ensure that you get everything out of this trip that you possibly can. When it comes to things like, you know, touching the black stone or the Rukn al Yamani, I would advise against, especially with the Hajj al Aswad, you're going to have to do more than just one act of haram to get there. You're going to have to push, shove, frail people, fit, whatever, everyone in your sight, line of sight that you need to, to get to touch that thing. So I advise during times of Hajj, definitely not worth it. I got to touch the Rukn and the Yamani, just pick a quiet, 
time, sorry, between the Hur and Asr or um, early on, way before Fajr, where you can go in and just, you know, ease your way closer into the Kaaba, towards the Kaaba, and then you'll be able to touch it. I mean, I just, you know, leaned over the top of some short people and, you know, it's just, just, just nice, nice and easy. But yeah, just focus on the the, the real the, the real meaty acts of worship is just make sure you get your your fun prayers are done inside the haram you're doing your tahajjud and if you focus on that you will be golden and that is it for this video if there are any other specific questions you have in relation to the hajj leave a comment down below and i will answer them um if there is anything you'd like me to talk about in more detail definitely again drop it drop it in the comments and i will attempt to make a video if a video will suffice or i will just directly answer it in the comments so i hope you enjoyed that video that was my hajj experience and just a few tips to help any future hajj goers inshallah the journey to hajj is made easy for us and the the path there is opened and we don't, you know, enforce unnecessary elements of resistance on ourselves and we also make it easier on ourselves to go and we don't, you know, have all these ridiculous requirements and checklists that we need to meet for ourselves before we go. It's the journey of a lifetime. I personally, God willing, want to do it as many times as possible and I hope that is the case for everyone else. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, and you know someone who's going to Hajj in the future, share this video around, leave a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. We've got lots more to come and we will see you in the next one.